We're live. It's Think Tech, and this is History Lens. I'm John David, and the host of the show. And today we have with us uh, Dr. Daniel Steinmetz Jenkins, who was who is uh, a scholar from Yale University. And uh, we, Dr. Jenkins, is a specialist on religion and uh, the the rise of neoconservatism in religion and uh, the rise and fall of secularism. Uh, he's uh, Currently got a book under contract with uh, Columbia University Press entitled uh, The Neoconservative Moment in France, Raymond Aron and the United States. And he's working on another book, The Rise and Fall of Global Secularism Since the Cold War. And Daniel's here this week in Hawaii to, to give a lecture at Hawaii Pacific University on uh, uh, religious liberty and, and uh, the rise of uh, uh, neoconservatism. So, uh, Daniel, thanks for being on the show. Ah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure yeah, to be here. Great, great stuff. So, so when we think about, let's can we get some definitions? So, how how do you find define neoconservatism? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think when most people think of neoconservatism, they think of the foreign policy inspirations behind the Bush administration's decision to um, conduct a war in Iraq um, as a result of 9-11 and the fear of weapons of mass destruction oh, in right, Iraq. Right, right. So typically yeah. I think when people think of neoconservatism they think of maybe the foreign policy hawks behind the Bush administration right. or maybe the foreign policy ideology of Paul Wolfowitz. Right, right. But yeah. it actually has a much longer history. It's uh, something that uh, was a term that was used to describe uh, a more conservative wing of the Democratic Party or at least some intellectuals in the Democratic Party mm -hmm. in the mid to late 1960s who didn't like the direction that the party was taking under Johnson and they didn't specifically like uh, the rise of the new left and they didn't like the direction of American foreign policy oh, that's really uh, after um, as a result of the Vietnam War very ah, okay. very concerned in fact that, that um, because of the Vietnam War the United States was losing the Cold War and, okay. and so they hmm. uh, in many ways um, uh, began to critique, if you will, the orientation of the Democratic Party in the late 1960s, early 1970s, and eventually wound up uh, by the time of the uh, Reagan's rise and uh, wound up in the Republican Party. Okay. So it's a bit of a different history than maybe the one that most people are uh, familiar with in terms of the Iraq War. It goes back a couple of decades longer. Okay. Um, and with different concerns depending on which decade. But, okay. Uh, yeah. So, but in terms of religion, neoconservative religious types, what, you know, where do they stand and what's their kind of, what's their agenda? I mean, right. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, one could make the argument that many neoconservatives were not religious at all. They uh, were, in fact, um, uh, maybe culturally conservative and therefore, because of that, uh, realized and recognized the importance role that religion plays in society and specifically uh, allowing for a kind of traditional value system to to be oh, maintained. Okay. okay. So you have, you know, there are people who don't like being called neoconservatives. One would be Daniel Bell, who wrote this book, The Cultural Contradictions sure. of Capitalism, sure. where he yeah. basically suggested that the kind of capitalism that had made American political economy successful was fun, was inseparable from, from a kind of Protestant uh, work ethic, oh, yeah. and that the new left in the 1960s, uh, in some sense, their lifestyle contradicted that kind of Protestant work ethic. So okay. in that sense, there's kind of a, um, if you will, uh, for pr strategic reasons and functionalist reasons, a kind of uh, value for religion in society. It has a restraining effect. And uh, it's not by okay. coincidence that many neoconservatives in the 1970s, I mean, they joined forces, whether knowingly or unknowingly, with uh, uh, evangelicals who were also uh, mobilized. Okay. Uh, in the early, uh, in the late 1970s with Jerry Falwell okay. uh, to present uh, kind of two of the main ideological foundations of the, of the Republican Party. So okay. um, whether neoconservatives are actually religious or not, maybe it's not the, 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 the important question. It's how yeah. they viewed religion and yeah, its role okay. in society. Okay. So in a sense, their, their uh, idea is that we need, the, that they themselves are not religious, but we need religion to serve as a kind of st structure in society Absolutely. yeah, Something. and to preserve values sure. and, and sure. show people the right path. And, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. In interestingly enough, I mean, uh, 
yeah, it's a cultural conser- form of cultural conservatism. Um, and it somehow, <laughs> although not a neoconservative, been revived uh, in the United States, at least that rhetoric, uh, with this idea of making America great again. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, and if you look okay. at someone like Steve Bannon, uh, yeah. the whole idea is that you need this uh, Judeo-Christian tradition to kind of curb the excesses of kind of uh, right, a right. sort of decadent lifestyle that, right. that would explain okay. the rise of the, okay, of the so 2008 financial crisis. So, so now that's, that's <laughs> becoming very clear now. Okay, so, so uh, and that helps, that helps us to understand, I think, in the uh, on the contemporary scene, you know, why uh, the evangelicals are so attached to Trump. So it, if, if I'm articulating this correctly, then it's a, a values issue, not necessarily a religion issue itself, because, of course, Trump is not a religious person by any means. He seems to be just the opposite, right? An amoral person. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't want to um, confuse terms here. I think the neoconservatives that I have in mind um, are actually kind of quite critical of, of Trump, mainly for, main reason would be for foreign policy reasons. Oh, okay. Oh. But the argument that I was making is something that they share in common, perhaps, with maybe uh, someone like a Steve Bannon would be the restraining effects that religion can have on curbing yeah. kind of uh, certain excesses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay. cultivating certain virtues that would, if you will, um, cultivate Good spending habits instead of ones that lead, lead to bad decisions, which <laughs> okay. Steve Bannon, interestingly enough, thought that was connected to why the 2008 financial crisis happened. There was too much, oh, yeah. um, uh, you know, this, Judeo, this restraining tradition wasn't in place. Okay. But that's different, actually, though, than the neoconservatives. That's, that's a different, they're moving, many are moving away from the Republican Party now, or okay. they're critical of Trump, they don't like Trump. And okay. as you mentioned, Trump isn't really... Uh, doesn't seem to be the most uh, religious of people, even though his admirers, many of his admirers <laughs> right, in the United right, States, right. Are, 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 do admire him. He's a, he presents a conundrum, I think, for many believers who are voting for him because of the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would think it would be a huge problem for religious people to vote for Trump because of his, you know, kind of out in the open ammorality, right? Or, right. Or Im- even immorality, right? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, there's <clears throat> diff- it's a challenging uh, to explain the kind of ways that different groups have gone about, ju- religious groups have gone about justifying their support for Donald Trump, knowing that his own lifestyle in many ways contradicts their own faith. And of course, uh, you know, one could just say that he gives them what they want. Uh, heal of the Johnson Amendment, um, he gives them, you know, uh, you know maybe su- the Supreme Court just- justices that they want. Right. And in exchange, right. he gets their support, and yeah. this is kind of a pragmatic relationship. Yeah. Yeah. It also could be a very theologically um, inspired uh, view of Trump, which is that he's kind of um, analogous to um, Cyrus, a great king um, in the Hebrew Bible, who allowed for uh, the end of the Babylonian captivity and for the for the, the Jews to return to ah, their homeland. Okay. And okay. even though he's a pagan king, he allows okay. for, ah. the, God uses right, such right. a person for it, redemptive purposes. But yeah, there's all kinds of ways to try yeah. to figure out that relationship. This is what I've heard, is that Trump is a broken vessel. Right. That, and, but the, the key is the vessel. Right. Its brokenness doesn't really matter if, if he can move things along in a way that religious people think. So, okay, so that's kind of, so there's some... There's apparently some, quite some variation among uh, what we would call neoconservatives or religious fundamentalists, re- religious evangelicals who support Trump. And you're saying, can you say a little bit more about uh, neoconservatives who are actually moving away from Trump? In this? So. Yeah, I mean, if you listen to someone like uh, <clears throat> Bill Crystal, for example, the son of Irving Crystal, I mean, very critical of the Trump administration. If you were to look at someone like Kagan, someone who's always been a yeah. promoter of American responsibility abroad, something what they perceive to be the isolationism of, of Donald Trump's foreign policy is, is a step in the wrong direction. Okay, right? And right, this was right. the same concern that many of the early neoconservatives had uh, regarding uh, what they considered to be a kind of Vietnam syndrome that had um, taken over the American foreign policy establishment yeah. in the okay. 70s, exemplified through detente and strategic arms limitation talks, but also through the turn to international human rights from the Carter administration. So. Um, uh, and the idea was that actually we're, we're, we don't, we're underestimating the, the, the threat of the Soviet Union, right? Just like okay. maybe if you talk to some neoconservatives today, we're underestimating the threat of d- that democracy uh, 
whether it be Islam or whether it be China, for instance, yeah, and we right, have to right. we have to have a, a strong view of America's role in the world. It, it, it in many ways there are some parallels with the older neoconservatives from the '70s and their their children today. Okay. Even though one major difference is the criticism of the Republican Party today okay. by neoconservatives. Okay. So you're referring to Robert Kagan and, yes. the, and, yes. the, and the, the the writer, the historian, right? Right. Yes. Correct. Yes. Okay. So. Okay, so that, that makes more sense. These are kinds of, of, of uh, the, the neocons that came out of the woodwork when we entered Iraq, right? right. The Iraq War in 2003. And, um, okay, so can you take us back a little bit and talk about that, the neoconservative movement uh, that, that you study in, in, in your, I assume this was your dissertation, then it became your first book. Right, yes. Well, I mean, I guess the purpose of the book is to try to suggest that, uh, even the story about the rise of neoconservatives in the late 1960s and the early 1970s is um, uh, a limited one insofar as that t story typically focuses on the United States. And, you know, yeah. in the 1960s, you had, uh, again, a group of what you could describe as vital center liberals, New Dealers, um, uh, that um, were not happy with the... Johnson's Great Society program. We're not happy with some of the directions that the Democratic Party were taking. It was the, that was that was taking in the 1960s, um, and uh, and there's also, as I mentioned, this thing about foreign policy. But this is a actually a transatlantic phenomenon, yeah, right. and, and it and it can't be just reduced to the United States. You had similar concerns in Germany, for instance, and in France. And one of the major concerns was the student protest movements that, okay. especially in the late 60s, that kind of rocked college campuses. And uh, of course, France, Paris would be the obvious, one of the biggest examples, the May 68 student protest movements, but also in Germany, also Berkeley, Columbia. There seemed to be um, a, a concern um, about uh, this new generation of students and the demands that they were making, okay. um, and, and that the, these demands somehow went against or were a threat, if you will, to kind of the great accomplishments of the post-war welfare state. Oh, um, interesting. And so yeah. the issue became yeah. trying to explain why um, a group of middle class, you know, um, generally um, economically stable college students at some of these elite schools uh, were so discontent, and many, such as Daniel Bell, uh, for instance, uh, said, well, we can only explain this at the level of culture. <clears throat> uh, right, there's cultural right. discontent. Sure, right. And uh, the fight for recognition amongst new groups seeking some uh, equality, whether it be women, gays, etc., uh, th they explain this at the level of culture. And, uh, and then they quickly, you know, Daniel Bell is famous for saying, um, cult, uh, in terms of culture, I'm a conservative. In terms of politics, I'm a liberal. In terms of economics, I'm a, I'm a socialist. But I think that's a true statement. Be, I mean, like that, wow. you have to have all three for him, right? Okay. Um, for him, you had to be a kind of cultural conservative if you wanted yeah. the political economy of the of the New Deal, right? Yeah. And it was these, if you will, um, these students who were disrupting this because their culture wasn't that of the New Deal, which was based on a Fordist model of the family, and it was quite conservative. Yeah. Uh, okay. So this, this, uh, this, this, there was kind of a cultural turn, if you will, amongst these kind of vital center ah, okay. liberals. Okay. And they recognized, okay, that culture is imploding. We have to somehow address this. And this also is an element of the neoconservative movement that you find not just in, uh, in the United States, but in, in France as well. I make the argument in the book that uh, something like this is of a concern of someone like Raymond Aron, the great French liberal, okay. who's very uh, struck by the, the student protest movements, famously calling them a carnival and a, and a psychodrama. Ah, okay. Um, okay. And very concerned. In a negative way. In a very in negative, negative way, yeah. Uh, by okay. carnival, he meant that the professors were behaving like students and the students were behaving like pr uh, professors and that uh, the <laughs> idea, that's good it, right? To me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but and we hold it there, Daniel. We're yeah. going to have to take a break. And when, when we come back, we're going to talk more about uh, neo, the rise of neoconservatism. I'm fascinated by this. So, yeah. okay, we'll be back in a minute. Thanks. Thanks. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. 
on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up. And please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. All right, we're back. We're live with Daniel Steinmetz Jenkins from Yale, and we're talking about the rise of neoconservatism in the United States and in Europe. And we were talking, Daniel, we were talking about uh, the, these young protesters and how uh, New Dealers, who accepted the liberalism of the New Deal, but were really repelled by this. Uh, they were cultural conservatives who were repelled by the kind of, oh, I suppose, what they saw as uh, the nihilism and the uh, the kind of uh, created as you go spirit of these young students. Right. Yeah, one thing that I should say uh, um, many of these uh, neoconservatives were some of the biggest proponents in the 1950s of what uh, was described as the end of ideology, which yeah. is this okay. notion that with the welfare state and with uh, kind of a certain political economy, yeah. revolutionary <clears throat> ideologies uh, wouldn't be necessary because you had the necessary. Uh, safety net in place to allow for uh, the workers to have, you know, basic security. Um, and I think what happened with these kind of uh, end of ideologists who became neoconservatives okay, is they, yeah. quick, they quickly realized yeah. that um, actually you need more than just the welfare state and you need more than just uh, oh, yeah. a certain form of political governance. You need a certain kind of culture. And, uh, yeah, right. And that, has, that goes a long way in explaining the, the, the neoconservative turn. The, it's a cultural turn, right? Okay. It's not just tweaking the economy. It's not just technocracy. It's actually culture as well. Um, and so, yeah, there was great, um, uh, and the students represented, if you will, cultural, I mean, discontent with, yeah. with, with the, yeah. that kind of conformist kind of, culture. Kind of Weberian, uh, the, the iron cage of modernity, right? Yeah, exactly. The, the exactly. man, the, the suit. Going up and down the <laughs> yeah. elevator day after day, yeah. a deadening, right? A deadening of human life. Well, and that's interesting. You mentioned it because many of these individuologists were actually very much influenced by Max Weber yeah. and the concerns about bureaucracy. Um, uh, so that's that. That is absolutely oh, okay. A, a good You're talking about the neocons as well. The neocons. Well, the, these were early, these early, well. these early ones that yeah. I have in mind were yeah. were kind of a barrier in an outlook. But okay. I think you can take what I'm saying though, and you can kind of put the pieces together. If you think of it as, if you think of the New Deal as entailing a certain kind of culture, which is quite conservative, you would see why, um, even if you're an atheist. Um, but you're a, a New Dealer and you're, a, and you're a cultural conservative, why something like, um, why, why there would be an acceptance of something like the evangelical movement? Because they provide you with that conservative culture, yeah, yeah, right? Right, they, that, right? That's And so, yeah. um, even though you might find their ideas totally ridiculous. Well, the, the, <laughs> the national audience for Billy Graham in the 1950s, right? He's yeah. kind of, uh, he's a national figure. Right. And it doesn't matter if you're Lutheran or Baptist or, right. or Methodist or Congregationalist, yeah. right? It's like, oh, he's... He's our kind of national pastor. Yeah, and that's interesting because the pastor before him, at least the national one, I think the person that typically gets associated with that was Reinhold Niebuhr, who right. was actually right. quite different uh, than Billy Graham and had very critical things to say about Billy Graham. Uh, but one has to ask the question, well, why not a Reinhold Niebuhr-type Protestant liberal uh, figure and instead a Billy Graham kind of evangelical cultural conservative figure and one of the reasons is because mainline Protestantism by the 1970s is slowly beginning to undo itself because the very kids who are becoming critical of culture are the children of mainline denominate. They, they attend the mainline churches. In other right. words, their children are rejecting their right, conservatism. Right, right. So they're okay. becoming secular. They're not around anymore. Okay, what other religious group is there? Oh, there's these evangelicals who were all over the political uh -huh. map in the, in the 40s and the 50s. Right, right, right. Now they're being mobilized for political purposes. They kind of, in some sense, replace. It's, but yeah. is, is, I mean, isn't it, isn't it true that, 
that uh, uh, the evangelicals, especially fundamentalists in the period from the 1920s into the 1950s, <laughs> were considered kind of cranks and kind of, you know, doofuses by, by the kind <laughs> of the Eastern elites and the intelligentsia, right? I mean, you right. know, they make a lot of fun of the evangelicals in the 1920s. Right. Well, what's, um, how, you know, I think... Sometimes we have ways of viewing the, the so-called fundamentalists that does, um, I think, uh, exhibit the kind of reputation that you just uh, described as being anti-modern and kind of uneducated, anti-intellectual, yeah, anti-secular, right, right. and so forth. Well, it rings bells for me in the <laughs> present day, honestly. There's been a wave of scholarship <laughs> to kind of call those things into question, but there's, okay. there's a reason oh, why, why that, that I think there's probably still something to it nonetheless. Um, but in the 1950s, you have uh, a new um, evangelical movement that breaks away from this, even in the 40s, that breaks away from this fundamentalism that is much more invested in culture and in mainstream American society, and that's okay. Billy Graham, right? Okay, yeah, so, yeah, right. So, right. in other words, you have the rise of the evangelicals and you have the, the decline, if you will, of the mainline Protestants, yeah. and at the very moment where these neoconservatives are worried, worried about mores and culture, yeah. so they can't rely really on those liberal Protestants because they're yeah. kind of dying out, okay. even though they're kind of still there, but they can rely on this new group that's now mobilized in the Republican Party for the first time. Okay, yeah. okay. And, so the, and thus they move into the Republican Party. At yeah, that yeah point. exactly. That's, at this okay. very moment that uh, the evangelicals are mobilized, uh, into the Republican Party um, to support Reagan is the very moment that many of these vital center, you know, lifelong Democrats leave the Democratic Party okay. and become Republicans. Right. And it's right. also at this very moment, too, where another group joins, well, another group forms kind of a uh, pillar of ideology of the Republican Party. That's the neoliberals. Okay. And so you have the neoliberals, sure. the neoconservatives, and the evangelicals come together. And what's interesting is those groups are kind of... Uh, Kind of coming apart today because of the Trump administration. Oh, okay. Uh, well, that's that's good news. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a question here, and, and my question is: uh, in the Reagan era, then why didn't the evangelicals embrace Reagan more readily? I, I, maybe it's the other way around. Maybe it's just that Reagan had just so little time for evangelicals that um, he he didn't actually implement much of the agenda of, of evangelicals, right? I mean, he tried a little bit. Right? right. Well, I mean, I think he's able to cater to them. Uh, it's fascinating that, um, you know, the president, of course, before Reagan was Jimmy Carter, a Democrat, and an evangelical. Right, that's right. And I think um, received the, the majority of evangelical support. Yes, but at that did. point, the evangelicals weren't mobilized the same way right. that they were under Reagan. Right. But, you know, if you recall the National Prayer Breakfast, what, in 1980, 1981, Reagan uses the language of evil empire to describe the Soviet Union. True. That's uh, a language that would have been familiar with many evangelicals because uh, they were huge readers of Hal Lindsey's The Late Great Planet Earth, ah, okay, uh, sure. and which had a very similar view of right, right. the Soviet Union. And right. Reagan was, uh, whether consciously or not, um, use that rhetoric, and that's the kind of language that uh, okay. they would understand. And so um, maybe, you know, supposedly he attended church less than any other president, yet he was, <laughs> yeah. he still to this day is admired, I think, by, um, a, by, by the evangelical community, right, without right. a doubt. Um, uh, so perhaps he could have done more, but he was effective. Well, he really fits your definition of the neoconservatives of that time, right? Because he was a new dealer. Yeah, yeah that's right. But he hated the, the 60s protesters. That's and right. The, Kind of the chaos that he felt they created. Exactly. And and he did nothing to undermine the New Deal, right? I mean, ex, you know, the tax reform you could say okay, but other than that, I mean, he's really not taking down the New Deal. Not not like current <coughs> current republic. Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe we overemphasize uh, that. Um, in you know, when we start stressing the influence of the neoliberals on the Reagan administration and and, and uh, under, with Thatcher as well, the fact that supposedly Hayek and people like Milton Friedman were, were right. a real influence um, on those administrations. Maybe we go too far um, in and, and sh and, and trying to stress that influence and project maybe 2008 into 1980 or 1978 or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, um, yeah maybe, maybe um, that, 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 yeah, that, 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 that very well could be the case. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so we're almost out of time, but bring us up to the the present day. I mean, uh, you're talking about a fracturing of the neoconservative movement, and uh, I know you're working on a book on religion and, and populism. Uh, do, is is this book uh, contemporary, or does it go back in as historical as well? I'm sure, but 
Are you bringing it up to the... Uh, yeah, I'm actually working on this, like a trade press book on religion and populism. You know, there are many different ways to explain what populism is. We struggle as academics to even, tr you know, uh, articulate what is the essence of populism. And it seems to me that most of the ways that uh, scholars go about it is to say that it's a problem of political representation. That's one. Okay. People right. don't feel represented by their parties or uh, their party leaders. And someone from the outside comes, you know, rises and says, well, I can, I can represent you. Okay, the yeah, system yeah. is rigged. Right. I can represent oh, you. Oh, well, that sounds so very familiar. This is, the, this is one explanation for populism. It's a political explanation. Right has very little to do with economics. Then there's the economic explanation, which says there is this kind of global financial system uh, that's run by Davos elites, and uh, people are putting their money offshore, and this, uh, the, the economic system is neoliberal, and it's not um, functioning properly. We need to kind of have a Brexit, or we need to you know, close down the EU, or we need to have tariffs, or we need to become isolationist, or and we need a fair distribution of wealth. So distribution of wealth is, economics is the second explanation. And okay. I think those explanations for populism go a long way in explaining what's going on. But one thing that strikes me that about those explanations is they don't really, they don't explain why, for instance, why, why, why are so many um, religious citizens in particular en enthusiastic about an Erdogan in Turkey or a, a by, about the kind of traditionalist discourse of, yeah. of Christian democracy in Hungary under Orban, or evangelicals with Bolsonaro in Brazil, or yeah. evangelicals with the Judeo-Christian tradition in the United States, which they somehow associated with Trump, or the list goes on. We can mention many examples. Right, and right. the relationship between religion and populism yeah. and right-wing populism, those two other explanations, the economic and the political explanation, don't seem to provide answers for that. Yeah, that's true. They don't uh, fit, right? They don't I mean, fit. The, the Democrats currently in 2020 are going to run on economic populism. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so, so <coughs> what fits then? I mean, just in, we've got like 30 seconds left. So. Well, um, I think many people on the left uh, are um, hesitant to um, look at the role that values play okay. uh, in, in why maybe a populist candidate is appealing. And all the examples that I just mentioned, whether it's Bolsonaro, whether it's Orban, or whether it's uh, uh, you know, Trump or whoever fill in the blank, they're all promoting kind of a kind of traditionalism. They all kind of look at, in many ways, Putin, who's not really a populist, but they look at Putin as a kind of way of providing an alternative to Western yeah, okay. secularism. Okay. Right, right. And so it's really, I think you have to take into consideration uh, oh. meaning and values okay. and, and trying to come up with a sense of collective understanding based on tradition yeah. that's providing, if you will, ways of dealing with right, automation right, right. and international capital. So it's, that, so it's in, way, it's, in a way, it's really not religion, but it sounds like Western civilization plus religion light. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, that, it's, it's the you discourse, know. if you will, of some kind of civilizationism. It's the discourse of some kind of value system that in some ways, you want to use the language of Karl Polanyi, um, the... the, the uh, it, it, it provides a way of dealing with capitalism, the disembedding effect, the oh, dizzying okay. effect of yeah, capitalism yeah. by encasing capitalism within tradition, yeah. within a particular okay. uh, value a, system. That's and I, very interesting. I think that's the thing that okay. needs to be emphasized a little bit more, not to the detriment of those other two, okay. but to combine those three together would okay. be, I think, a way to go. Well, we're going to have to stop here, but uh, <laughs> Daniel, thanks so much for coming yeah, in. Thanks. Appreciate Great it. to have you. Appreciate and, the time. Uh, tune in for another episode of Think Tech. <laughs>